Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome back to um, uh, Opera at Pop Up, a 24 hour long Opera Arts conference. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Ching from Amherst College, who is going to give us a talk called Goodwillie Calculus in Opera Arts. Um, and before he starts, uh, I'd like to just say uh, if you have questions, please type them in uh, the chat either on on Twitch or on Zoom, and we will um, either Olivia or I will uh, will raise them to the speaker. Um, and yeah, thanks. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Philip. Thank you. Um, a big big thank you to to all the organizers of this wonderful conference. It's really a fantastic idea, and and you know I really enjoyed the the talks I've been awake for so far. Um, and I guess I also wanted to, to thank the organizers for arranging this on, on the 11th of August in particular, because that's my mom's birthday. Um, and so I thought it's a nice way to, um, you know, to celebrate my mom's birthday um, by giving a, a talk about opera ads. Um, so, so this talk is, uh, is, is dedicated to my mom on her birthday. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a talk about opera ads. Um, and uh, let me try to make sure hopefully that's visible okay um opera ads and calculus um and so i'm gonna start um with the basic calculus i guess um and that is um a formula known as the fardi bruno formula which is just the, the higher chain rule the chain rule for higher derivatives so um if you haven't seen this before it's a nice little exercise to um to, to figure out what the chain rule looks like for higher derivatives so Here's uh, one version of that. Um, so let's imagine we have a, a smooth function with a, a Taylor series. And I've written the Taylor series in a, maybe a slightly unusual notation here, um, which will tie in a little better with the, the, you know, the notation I'm going to use in functor calculus in a minute. Um, so, you know, so I've got these uh, the, 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 um, the terms in the Taylor series I've written using these uh, multilinear um, function, these, these DNFs. Um, but this is just the, the usual formula for the Taylor series. Um, and then this, uh, you know, using, using this um, the, you know, Taylor series expansion, you can work out what you get if you um, compose two functions. And, and so here is, um, for some reason my slides are appearing slightly off center, but let's see if I can fix that. Um, so the, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this in full screen and see if it's any better. Um, so, so this is the, so down the bottom then we have this uh, Fardy Bruno formula. Um, and uh, as far as I know that th this appeared well before Fardy Bruno um, first mentioned it in, in 1800 is the first reference I, I know of. Um, and it just tells you that the, um, the, the Taylor coefficients of the composite of two smooth functions um, is given by a formula that looks very um, sort of uh, persuasive if you know anything about operats. So uh, this being an operats conference, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, that most people watching see the pattern in this, in this formula and the, the connection with operats. And at the bottom here, I've written a, a sort of summary of the, the Bardi Bruno formula in, in, again, a sort of notation very reminiscent of the notation we use for, for operands. Um, if you put all of the Taylor coefficients together into a, into a sequence, the derivatives of GF are given by a sort of composition product of the derivatives of G with the derivatives of F. Okay, so sort of motivated by that, I want to talk about Goodwillie calculus. Um, and, and so that's, uh, um, so, so let me take a couple of slides just to give you sort of background. Um, and, and sort of fix the notation. So, um, so I'm going to be talking a lot about infinity categories and, and sort of fairly arbitrary infinity categories. Um, I guess I've used the word suitable here um, because I don't really want to get into the, the specific details, but um, if you like, I think you can take suitable to be compactly generated um, for most of this talk. Um, but in any case, if you have a functor between suitable infinity categories, then, then Goodwillie showed how to construct a Taylor tower. And this is the, the analog um, in functor calculus of the Taylor series. It's a sequence of approximations um, which satisfy a universal property that, that Goodwillie called being n-excisive. Um, and this is an analog of the, 
being polynomial of degree n. Um, and I won't go into the details of what n excisive means, but for one excisive, um, it's easy to say a function is one excisive if it takes pushouts to pullbacks. Okay, so um, some examples. Uh, the first sort of obvious example to try is maybe the identity functor. Um, so I'm writing this, this S star for the category of pointed topological spaces. Um, and I'll be coming back to that example again and again. Um, so S star is, is pointed spaces. Um, and you know, the first thing to observe is the identity functor has a non-trivial Taylor tower. Unlike in ordinary calculus, it's not a degree one polynomial um, for the simple reason that pushouts and pullbacks are not the same in the category of pointed spaces. Um, and so if you work out what is the degree one approximation, the one excisive approximation, then you get this functor loops infinity, sigma infinity um, coming from stable homotopy theory. Um, on the other hand, if you uh, work in spectra, um, so SP here is, is the infinity category of spectra. Um, well, then pushouts are the same as pullbacks. And so the identity functor is one excisive in, in that stable setting. And that's, that um, difference is really, um, to some extent, the theme of, of this talk and the theme of good willy calculus in, in general is the, you know, the difference between stable and unstable situations. Um, okay, so um, let me talk about derivatives. And these are the analogs of the, um, those, those DNF functions I, I showed you on the first slide for the Taylor series. Um, so in Goodwillie calculus, we, we can um, find derivatives by looking at the, the layers of the Taylor tower, that is the fibers of these, these connecting transformations. Um, so Goodwillie writes DNF for the, the homotopy fiber of the, the map from Pn to Pn minus one. Um, and then another of the main theorems that, that Goodwillie proves is a, a sort of um, classification of these kinds of functors. These are homogeneous functors. Um, they played the role of homogeneous polynomials. Um, and Goodwillie shows that, that any such functor can, can be written in a, in a very special form. And, and so I've given you this formula for, um, the, you know, for DNF. Um, it basically, it, it factors in a, a, a number of ways. Um, and um, the, the main point I, I want to make, I won't, I won't read out this whole formula, but the main point is that this layer is classified by um, a symmetric multilinear functor. So that's this, this curly DNF um, is a symmetric multilinear functor. It, it's defined um, on the stabilization of C. So SP of C here is the, the stabilization the, or spectra in the infinity category C. It's the, the universal stable infinity category associated to C. Um, and, and this multilinear functor takes values in spectra in D. Um, and, and you should think of this as the, the analog of that um, sort of nth Taylor coefficient um, of the Taylor series. And so I'm, I'm going to call this the nth derivative. Um, that's maybe slightly un, you know, um, unusual terminology. It, it's, it's sometimes more common to, to refer to a particular spectrum as the nth derivative. Um, and um, in, in the case when, you're, when you want to talk about fairly general infinity categories, um, it, it's a little easier um, rather than trying to you know, tease out a single coefficient, it's, it's a bit easier to consider this whole functor. Um, it plays the same role as, as the um, individual coefficient. Um, here's a, an example just to um, sort of illustrate that point and, and also you know, give, give you some examples of derivatives. Um, so the first example, um, again, going back to pointed spaces, um, so the identity functor from pointed spaces to pointed spaces. Um, the derivatives of this functor were, were calculated by Aron and Mahold in, in 99, um, and they have something to do with the Lie operad. Um, and that's, if you like, the first sort of hint of um, how Goodwillie's calculus is, is going to be connected with, um, with operands. Um, you, so what I've done here is I've written out the, the actual formula in, in the notation you know, that I've, I've used before, um, but you can see that this, this multilinear functor is, is given by a single coefficient, that the Lie of n is, is sort of like a coefficient um, that, that 
you know, determines the entire functor. And sometimes that Li of n is, um, is referred to as the, the nth derivative of the identity. Um, and then I wanted to give another example, which also is going to feature a lot um, in the rest of the talk. Um, and that is um, this functor sigma infinity loops infinity. Um, so um, this also has interesting derivatives. Um, and, and these are, I, I don't actually know of exactly the, the kind of first place these are calculated. They probably, I, I should be re referencing Goodley again here, um, but I know that, that Nick Kuhn and, and Randy McCarthy both work with, um, with, with you know, the calculations of functors like these. Um, and, and the particular reason that I've put this example up there is because the, the derivatives of sigma infinity loops infinity um, are given by what you might call the commutative cooperad. Um, I'm going to come in a minute to, to sort of why I'm thinking of the second one as a cooperad and the first one as an operad. Um, that'll sort of be the main theme of the, um, the, the rest of the talk. Um, but again, you know, this is just a calculation that you, that you can do using all of the, the tools that, that Goodwilly gave us. Okay, so, so that's the, the derivatives. Um, so then let's try to connect this back with the chain rule, which was the sort of motivation at the beginning um, for, you know, for the connection between uh, calculus and operads in the, the Fardy Bruno case. Um, and so, so this is uh, the first sort of main result in, in, in that setting um, is really an, a direct analog, and I've used exactly the same notation. Um, it's a direct analog of that Fardy Bruno formula from, from the, first, um, the first slide. Um, so I want to emphasize sort of one thing in particular about the, the conditions here, and that is that this, this middle category, the, the category D, here has to be stable um, for this formula to, to be true. Um, so uh, this formula, you know, I, so, so this is, I, I proved this in the case of spectra. Um, there's a version in, in, uh, for chain complexes on abelian categories due to Christine Bauer and, um, and a few other people. Um, and I guess, you know, in, in some level, the, the proof of this formula is not that much harder than the proof of the original Fardy Bruno formula. There's, there's, some, there's some sort of extra um, intricacies that, that come from the fact that, that Taylor Towers in Goodwillie calculus don't usually split up into just the sum of the individual pieces. Um, it's one of the main differences between ordinary calculus, where the Taylor series is just the sum of its terms, um, and Goodwilly calculus where um, those terms, those layers are, are usually, um, you know, uh, woven together in a more complicated way. Um, but despite that, it, it turns out that when you look at derivatives and when you look at the chain rule, you get, do get exactly this, the same uh, sort of composition product formula for the derivatives of, of a composite. Michael? Um, yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat, uh, but E doesn't have to be stable. Is that correct? Yeah. So in, in, in this, you know, the, the hypotheses here, C and E do not have to be stable. It's really that middle, um, infinity category that matters. Um, so, you know, you're, and, and, and I, I guess I, I, maybe that makes some sense that, um, you know, that, that middle category is kind of where the action is happening. You're, you're taking kind of, um, if you think of the, you know, F produces um, diagrams in D um, and the, the condition on being excisive or, or inexcisive is about whether those diagrams are, are pullbacks. Um, and then uh, you know, when, you, when you look at G uh, acting on those diagrams, you are interested in whether they're push outs. So the fact that push outs and pullbacks are, are the same in a stable infinity category is kind of the, the thing that makes this work. Um, but C and E do not have to be, do not, there, there are no particular hypotheses on C and E. Okay, so, um, so that, as I said, that's, that's really the same uh, sort of uh, chain rule that you, you get for um, ordinary calculus. 
Um, but what consequences does this have? So here is um, one of the consequences, I guess, and, and there are, there's, a, there's actually, a, you know, you get a lot more from that, uh, that theorem than, than just this, but I, I want to highlight um, what this tells you about this sigma infinity loops infinity functor. Um, and let me let me emphasize that that I you know I, I want to write this in a very general way. So so C here is is one of these uh, fairly general and and I guess I, I see I've written it out explicitly um, pointed and compactly generated infinity category. Um, and in that setting, you have an adjunction. You have um, you know you you have sigma infinity and loops infinity, and they are the generalizations of the the sort of ordinary. Uh, suspension spectrum and infinite loop space functors that you have for, for topological spaces and spectra. Um, and that adjunction, uh, of course, gives you gives rise to a co-monad. Um, so, you know, so sigma infinity loops infinity in whatever context you're working, that is for, for any infinity category C, um, you get a co-monad um, on the, the stabilization, on spectra of C. And, and so now um, it's, it's fairly easy to, to see that if, if we combine this co-monad structure with the, the chain rule that, that appears in the, at the top, um, we get a co-operad structure on the derivatives of sigma infinity loops infinity. And I've just written out the sort of co-multiplication at the bottom here. Um, you, you first you apply the co-monad structure map for sigma infinity loops infinity. Um, and then you use the chain rule to split that up. Um, so uh, Greg Aron and I sort of wrote down this, this procedure in the case where C was pointed spaces. Um, and I guess, you know, it, I, I don't know of anywhere where like this process is actually written down in the generality that, that I've described it here. And, and, and I guess there's a, there's sort of a reason for that. And, and that is that, um, the equivalences in the theorem at the top, these, these, these chain rule equivalences, um, you know, I've, I've just sort of stated this as an equivalence you have for any pair of functors f and g, but I, I haven't made any particular claims about um, associativity or, or other conditions that you might want. And, and, and it's not that I don't believe that those conditions hold, it, it's more that um, actually making this D star construction into a, a, a proper monoidal functor um, in the, the sense that, you know, is sort of implied by, by this equivalence. Um, I've never actually sort of seen that done in, in kind of the precise way that, that it's stated here. So, so that's why I've said this is not written down in general, um, not because I don't believe it's true in general, but I, I've never, I, I don't know that anyone's actually written it down in, in this way. Um, so, so sort of at the moment, I'm, I'm kind of claiming this just in this, this one example, I guess, that um, where C is um, pointed spaces. Um, and in that case, this, this calculation, you know, uh, this, is, this is what Greg and I showed in, in 2011. Um, this recovers the commutative cooperative in spectra, um, which, is, which is sort of what that earlier calculation um, referred to. Okay, um, I'm going to take a slide to um, talk a little bit more generally about operads and, and infinity operads. Um, and I want to, I, I guess the reason I want to do this is, is in particular to try to um, match up um, maybe what many people um, watching this talk already think of as an operad um, with the way I'm, I'm kind of treating operads in a slightly different way. In particular, I've got, you know, my, the, the terms of my operads and cooperads, um, you might have noticed, are actually functors. So these are, these are really some kind of functor cooperads. And, and I, I guess I want to make precise exactly what that um, connection is. So, so here, is, here is a definition, and I, you know, I should warn you, having just claimed that I was going to be making things precise, I am not making things precise. Um, so this is not a precise formal definition of a stable infinity operad. Um, you, should, you should look in Lurie's higher algebra if you want that um, more formal definition. Um, but this is uh, certainly for the purposes of this talk, um, how I want us to think about um, infinity operads and, and stable infinity operads. So 
Um, the, the kind of slogan here, and, and this is, seems like a perfectly good definition, a, a stable infinity operad is a spectra enriched symmetric multi-category. Um, so these are, first of all, these are, these are the, the um, you know, versions of colored operads or multi-categories. Um, and so we start with a, a collection of objects um, or, or sometimes called colors. Um, and then we have these, these multi-mapping uh, objects. So in the stable setting, these are going to be spectra. So, um, so for objects C1 through Cn and D, we have a spectrum um, which represents the maps from the, the entuple C1 through Cn to the object D. Um, and I've restricted to n being greater than or equal to one because um, I really want to focus on non-unital um, operands here. These are so these are going to be operands that encode non-unital algebras, non-unital or, or augmented algebras. Um, so those spectra, the, these things I've written as sort of O of C1 through Cn, comma uh, D, those are the terms that you might usually think of as the, the terms in the operand. So if, you, if you're starting from a kind of um, what I might call a classical view on operands, then um, this, these are the terms that, you, you know, um, that appear in the definition of colored operand. Um, and of course, there are lots of um, structure maps. So there are composition maps, um, which really make this into a multi-category. Um, symmetry maps, which allow you to permute the, the, the n entries, C1 through Cn. Um, and of course, a lot of diagrams that have to commute. And if we're working with infinity operands, then a lot of higher coherence diagrams, which also have to commute and, and so on, which of course I'm not going to try to get into. Um, and, and so then there's one uh, extra condition that I want to, to put on O to make it into what we'll call a stable infinity operad. Um, and that is, I want the, the underlying category. So, so O, this, this O less than or equal to one, this is the, um, this is what you get if you only look at, you know, uh, N equals one, um, I guess there's no N equals zero. So only N equals one, um, then you, you just get a category an, an ordinary spectra enriched category. Um, and I actually want that infinity category to be stable. Um, and what that means is it's not just enriched in spectra, it's, it's also uh, closed under finite co-limits. Um, and this is, the, this is gonna be, this is a sort of a point where it will probably be confusing if you're used to a, a kind of working with say single colored operads, um, because my collection of colors or my collection of objects is now going to be very large. So, for example, um, it might be all finite spectra. Um, so, I might have my objects um, be the finite spectra. That would be uh, a stable infinity category. Um, and and so, so I guess I'm sort of emphasizing the the multi-category part more. I'm, I'm this is going to be sort of um, much more connected with stable infinity categories and and their theory than um, than you might have thought. Okay. Um, so here is then, so given all that intro, here is the sort of definition that connects this notion of operad with the, the functor operads and co-operads. Um, and so this is a notion of uh, co-representability. Um, and it's, it's a fairly simple condition. So we say that a, a stable infinity operad is, is co-represented um, if its, its multi-mapping spectra are co-representable functors. So that is, um, they're given by, they're determined by some um, Fn's. So some sequence of functors from C to the N to C. Um, and you have this formula that, that tells you how the multimorphism objects are, are related, you know, are, are represented or co-represented by those uh, functors Fn. Um, and and it's a not too hard exercise to see that if you have that, that condition, then the FNs um, must automatically um, form what looks like a, a co-operad structure. So, so you get automatically these natural transformations, which are determined just by the, the operad composition 
um, apps um, that make these functors into a cooperad. And, and this is one of the, I think, maybe most confusing parts about this story is that even though the thing we started out with was an operad, um, the natural uh, thing you get in this co-representable situation is, is more like a co-operad. Um, and so I know this has been something that's confused me um, in trying to understand some of, of Lurie's um, work on, on uh, operads and their relevance in Gabuli calculus. Um, but having said that, you can also get functor operads um, by just working in the opposite category. So um, if, if, the, if the operad O is co-represented on C op, then, then what you have is a functor operad on C. Okay, all right, so that's, that's sort of the, the intro um, to some extent. And so now I'm gonna get into the, the main part of the talk perhaps, which is um, different ways to um, get these kinds of operad structures, um, operad and cooperad structures on derivatives. Um, and I already sort of mentioned um, the one, you know, the, the derivatives of sigma infinity loops infinity, but I said that there wasn't a very sort of well written out version of that. Um, and so the first, this is the first part of a trilogy. There are, there are gonna be three of these. So the first part of the trilogy um, is based on a very um, simple observation. And this lemma is, um, again, it's something that you can just calculate using the, the basic definitions and constructions that, that Goodwilly um, came up with. Um, if you multilinearize the, the Cartesian product functor, so this is just the functor that takes the product of n objects in C, um, it turns out that multilinearization is the nth derivative of sigma infinity loops infinity. Um, and this has a very nice consequence. Um, so the, the second box here, this is, so this is Lurie's, really Lurie's approach to um, uh, operad structures in Goodwilly calculus um, is if you, the, um, the Cartesian product functors have a functor cooperad structure, which is just comes from the fact that um, the Cartesian product is a monoidal structure. Um, the functor cooperate structure is just given by equivalences, the, the usual equivalences um, according to the associative, uh, associativity property of the, the product. Um, and so if you multilinearize that structure, um, what Lurie shows is that you then get a, a functor cooperate structure on the derivatives of sigma infinity loops infinity. Um, so that's a very nice way of, of just kind of building this this structure, it, it gives a sort of universal property as well for the derivatives of sigma infinity loops infinity. Um, and, and so that's a, a very kind of, you know, very nice construction. Um, it, it's not at all obvious from this how, what it has to do with the, the approach that I talked about earlier involving the chain rule and, and so on. But, um, but anyhow, this is, this is one, one very nice approach. And uh, it also has, has seen a lot of use and, and I'll mention in particular the work of Heiss Hoitz um, on co-algebras over this co-operad. Um, so, so Heiss shows that um, you can actually approximate the, the entire infinity category C, or you can sort of, you know, approximate it up to um, Taylor Towers. Um, so you're, you're building the Taylor Tower of the infinity category C um, using co-algebras over this co-operad, um, um, together with some extra information, which, which um, he calls Tate diagonals. Um, so anyhow, that's, that's a very nice application or sort of extension, in fact, of, of Lurie's approach. Okay, so the, the second part of the trilogy, um, so all, you know, second parts of trilogies have to have subtitles. So, so the, the second part of this trilogy is subtitled Causal Duality. Um, and it's also based on a nice observation. And this observation really goes back to uh, Gregor Rohn and, and Maria Kankanrinta. Um, and it basically tells you how the derivatives of the identity functor are related to the derivatives of this sigma infinity loops infinity. Um, so you have this, uh, uh, this first equivalence um, is the, the basic sort of calculation here. Um, and that tells you that you can recover the derivatives of the identity as the, the totalization of a co-simplicial object. Um, 
So it's the cosimplicial object, which effectively comes from the, that adjunction, that sigma infinity loops infinity adjunction. So that you, if you form a cobar construction using that co-monad um, and you insert derivatives at the appropriate point, then, then you get uh, a way to recover the derivatives of the identity. Um, and then we can use the chain rule. So the derivatives of, of that whole thing inside of the tote, um, that's a big composite of functions. Um, and so applying the chain rule um, for the, the, you know, the, the chain rule in the case where the middle category is stable, which is, is what we have here, um, we can write this as um, a more explicit cobar construction. And, and that's what the way I've, I've sort of put at the bottom here is that the derivatives of the identity um, can be identified with a, um, a cobar construction, a reduced cobar construction on the cooperad given by the derivatives of sigma infinity loops infinity. Um, so, um, what does that tell us? Well, um, this is where causal duality comes in or, or bar cobar duality. Um, and if you take the cobar construction on a cooperad, then, then what you should get is, is an operad. Um, and, and so um, the reason, the reason I've, I've stated this as a conjecture is because I, I, again, don't know that anyone's really written down this bar cobar duality um, at the level of these stable infinity operands. Um, so, uh, you know, so what we need to make sense of this is a, a number of, you know, we, we need to take that functor cooperad given by the derivatives of sigma infinity loops infinity, and we need a, a cobar construction that will actually produce um, a, a functor operad. Um, and I, I don't know how to do that in general. Um, in the, the special case of, of spectra, or, or rather of, of pointed spaces, and you know, for operads and cooperads in spectra, um, this uh, bar cobar duality um, is, is easier to write down. Um, and so in that example, um, so at the bottom here, the first example then is, is when C is the, um, is pointed spaces, um, you do get the derivatives of the identity are an operad um, and, you know, they are the, this is the sort of causal dual of the commutative operad, um, which uh, it's reasonable to, to refer to as the Lie operad in spectra. Um, the, the second example here um, is, is recent work of Duncan Clark, um, who carries out this same process um, of um, taking this, this, these totalizations and using this to construct a, an operad structure. Um, so he does this where C is the category of algebras over an operad. Um, and so the, formally it's, it's a very, very similar picture. And, and, and again, um, there's, there's some sort of clever specific work that goes into actually making um, the result into an, an operad. Um, and, and so Duncan does that. And, and, and what he also shows is that the derivatives of the identity in that case um, recover just the operad O that you started with. Um, and, and that fact is actually the one I'm gonna come back to right at the end of this talk. So, so, so Duncan has a, a perspective on, on that um, for, for operads in spectra and, and I'm gonna um, come back to that, um, that equivalence. Okay, so, so that's two parts of the trilogy, um, two sort of different ways to, to try to get at operads um, uh, you know, or try to try to get um, at the way operads come into good Willy calculus. And so the third part of the trilogy, um, you know, maybe you're wondering what the, the, sub the subtitle is and, and you know, the third part of a trilogy always has to have the best subtitle um, because people are otherwise not going to pay attention and, and day convolution is definitely the best subtitle. So um, the third part of the trilogy is, is Goodwillie Derivatives and Operads 3, Day Convolution. Um, all right, so what is day convolution and, and what does it have to do with this, this setting? Um, so, uh, so this definition at the top then. So FC is um, a category of functors from C to spectra. So the first thing to say here then is that we're, we're going to focus on functors from C to spectra, where C is, C again is our fairly general 
uh, compactly generated pointed infinity category. Um, and I want to look at functors from CEDA spectra. And I'm going to take the deconvolution of two functors from FC to spectra. So um, you have to be careful to keep track of the different lay layers here. So A and B are, are functors from the category of functors um, to spectra. Um, and, and let me just give you, you'll, you'll, if you have read ahead to the bottom, you'll have already seen this, but the, uh, a good example to have in mind for the A and B here is the process of taking derivatives. Um, because taking derivatives, either first derivatives or second derivatives or, or whatever, um, that's a way to take a functor and produce a spectrum. Um, okay, so, so if A and B are, are two of these uh, functors from FC to spectra, then I want to form the, the deconvolution. So deconvolution is a, a way to produce a monoidal structure on a functor category. Um, and uh, the, there's two structures. So, so I have a, a monoidal structure on the, the source category. And, and in this case, that's the pointwise smash product. So the pointwise smash product of functors in FC. Um, and in the target category, the smash product is just the, the monoidal product is just the smash product of spectra. Um, so I can form the day convolution of these two, and, and that is uh, the left con extension. So I've, I've written out that definition as the left con extension. But the, the crucial part here is that that, um, that produces a monoidal structure on the category of functors from FC to spectra. And, and I've realized, um, looking at my slide here, that I've completely forgotten to give the appropriate credit for this idea, which is, is due to Saul Glasman. Um, I think I, you know, I, because I've used this day convolution so much recently, I've sort of, it's, it's become part of, you know, the vocabulary that I use and I've, I've completely forgotten that, um, you know, it's actually a really hard thing to, to make this construction for infinity categories. And, and so, so Saul Glasman um, made this, this construction of day convolution work in the infinity category setting for monoidal infinity categories. And that's really, uh, that's a crucial part of this whole story, which, which I certainly should have recognized. Um, so, so given that uh, definition of day convolution, the, the, the kind of first theorem and, and this thing at the bottom, it, in a sense, it's just a warm up because I, I'm not actually going to use this theorem later, but, but it's a kind of interesting observation um, and it, um, it sort of highlights how day convolution is related to good really calculus and, and derivatives um, in that the, the nth derivative um, and this is now the, the process of taking the nth derivative rather than the nth derivative of a specific functor, it's the nth derivative itself as a functor. Um, that can be written as a day convolution of n copies of the first derivative. Um, and uh, so the, the, the x1 through xn here are the inputs. So remember the nth derivative is actually a, a functor of n variables. Um, and so the, the nth derivative um, evaluated at x1 through xn is given by the day convolution of, of these, these n copies of the first derivative evaluated at each of x1 through xn. Um, so that's, that's sort of the first uh, hint that, that day convolution, this particular day convolution is, is a useful thing to, to look at. Um, so, uh, so, here is, I think, you know, from my perspective, the, the main theorem of, of this talk, um, because this is, uh, this, um, this theorem explains how to get the derivatives of the identity. Um, in the previous slide, we were focused on functors from C to spectra. Um, but what I'm really interested in for, for this talk are um, functors from C to C, or in particular, the identity functor. Um, and, and so the, the, the theorem says that, you know, the theorem tells us how the derivatives of the identity functor are related to this day convolution product. Um, and the, the slogan, which is in the first line there, is that the derivatives of the identity functor give you the co-endomorphism operad of the first derivative. Um, so to, to try to explain what, what I mean by that, um, if you look at the, the second 
uh, part of this. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be brave and and try to do some annotations just to emphasize because this is I think the key. So I, I'm looking at this um, this formula here, um, and this is meant to be a this is a coendomorphism operad construction. Um, if you know if um, if you don't see that right away, then um, if, forget about the x1, xn, and y. So imagine that you know we were sort of in the uh, a monochromatic setting where we just had a single object. Um, then this would in, entirely look like the, the construction of the coendomorphism operand. That is, it's the the mapping object from d1 into d1 uh, tensor n times. So this is really just the, um, the, the, the colored version of the coendomorphism operand, if you like. Um, and, um, and so the theorem is that that, that uh, operand structure, which exists for, you know, that, that, that's a very general construction of the coendomorphism operand, um, that, uh, that structure is co-representable. And th this comes back to that definition I gave earlier when, when I was talking about these stable infinity operads. Um, uh, a stable infinity operad can be, um, you know, so, such as this coendomorphism operad is co-represented um, when it's determined basically by a functor. Um, and in this case, the, the, the nth derivative of the identity um, determines that. Um, but you'll notice that um, if, you, if you do go and compare this back to the, the previous slide, you'll see that this is mapping into, this is maps from y into the nth derivative of the identity. So really this is a, a situation where we've, we're co-represented on an opposite category. And so the comment I've put at the bottom um, just points that out that um, what we have here is a, a stable infinity operad. Um, and uh, so I'm the, this, this notation that I'm using for this, um, you know, it, when I enter this in, in, in tech, it's an I, but, it, but to me, it definitely looks like a J. So, um, you know, I, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna call it J, even though I, you know, I'm, I'm really thinking of it as I for identity. Um, but anyhow, so um, we have a stable infinity operad, uh, JC, um, and, and this is co-represented by the derivatives of the identity. And that tells us the derivatives of the identity are a, a functor operad. Um, and these are exactly the, the, the sort of op general operad structure on the derivatives of the identity um, that we were, were kind of looking for. All right, so, so that's the, as I said, that's to some extent the, the, the central uh, result here. Um, I want to make a, a sort of a, a side, um, let's see, a side comment result, or, or, or give you a, a kind of slight um, extension of this result. Um, and that is to say that- Michael, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, just uh, maybe it'd be better if Ian would ask this. Um, yeah, I can ask it if that's okay, if you can hear me. Yeah, sure. we can hear. Okay, so it was on the previous slide. Okay. So it's the, it's the theorem you've stated. So, or I guess the, uh, the idea that you're using the derivatives as your A and your B. So if you take a particular, if you just take the, the first derivative, mm -hmm. then that doesn't get you a functor from the functor category to spectra because you just get another functor unless your, deriv unless your derivative is like, representable or whatever, if it's smashing with the derivative spectrum, right? So, so the way I so the way I'm uh, working with derivatives, the, the way I've sort of defined derivatives is as the so the, the symmetric multilinear functors that appear in the, the classification of the Taylor Tower. Okay. So so in this um, you know this this D one here, um, you know this so so if we sort of focus on on this, what what is that object? Um, so so I think I think I defined and I guess I'm going to try to draw with the mouse, which is never a good idea. Um, but but D1F um, would be, uh, would go from uh, just spectra of C, this is 
strangely not as bad as I expected, but still not good. Um, so it would go from spectra of C to spectra of, I guess, spectra of spectra. And spectra of spectra is spectra. So, um, so I don't know if, if that is, is that answering your question. So I'm yeah, sort of so, so what you're, yeah, so you're saying that anytime you pick n inputs, then you get a functor from this f sub c to spectra. You're That's not right. trying to do it sort of agnostic of the n inputs. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yes. That so, was so. That was the question. Good. Good. Yes. No. That's exactly right. So, so I've sort of you, you could think of the statement of this theorem as first I'm fixing x one through x n, um, and then I'm making a statement about the particular functor from f c to spectra that you get when you evaluate at those Got x one through x n. Because you you understand what I mean when I say like the derivative as a spectrum, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I don't know if the same result holds in the case that you do take the derivative as a spectrum, because then you don't have to put in any inputs, right? The, so, so this is a good, a good thing for me to say to try to match up these two different ways of looking at it. Um, so if, if C itself was, um, let's say, pointed spaces or spectra, um, so that spectra of C is just spectra, um, then what you could put in is you could take all of the X's to be the sphere spectrum. And if you did that, you would then be getting out just a single spectrum. And that would be the thing usually referred to as the, the coefficient. So, so if you, if you input the sphere spectrum in every position, then you get the, the usual kind of, or, or one version of the, the derivative as a single spectrum. Great, thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm apparently unable to. There we go. Okay. All right. So, um, so I gave you this this theorem about the derivatives of the identity, and and I wanted to um, to just tell you how it extends to other functors. And so here is a similar statement, but um, for uh, now an arbitrary f from c to d where c and d are pointed uh, uh, compactly generated infinity categories and I think f is, is reduced. Um, but you can, uh, you can get the derivatives of f in a fairly similar way. And, and I don't want to go into this formula um, except to notice that this gives you a bimodule. Um, so if you, if you figure out what a bimodule over these, these kinds of stable infinity operads should be, um, th this gives you a, a bimodule. And so this is a sense in which the derivatives of an arbitrary functor can be viewed as a bimodule over the derivatives of the identity on the source and target categories. Okay, um, so the rest of the talk, the, the, you know, the, the last thing I want to go over is this example I referred to earlier of the the case of algebras over an operad. Um, so this was the example that, that Duncan Clark had, had worked out in the case of where O is um, an operad of spectra. Um, and and so, um, so I want to talk about a, a very, a very similar, that's essentially the same result, um, but in the context that I've been, been thinking about um, with the day convolution and, and, and these definitions. Okay, so, so let me try to fix um, the, um, you know, the, 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 the definitions here. Um, so, so I want to talk about algebras over one of the, the stable infinity operands that, that I talked about earlier. Um, and, and so what is an algebra over um, a, a multi-category? Well, um, for each object in the multi-category, you, you have um, an object. And I, I guess here I'm going to focus on algebras in spectra. So so the target category of my algebras is, is only going to be spectra. You could, you could generalize that and, and wonder what happens if you put some other symmetric monoidal category there. But, but let's just look at algebras in spectra. So we have, uh, for each object of O, we have a spectrum A of C. And then the structure maps um, give you the action of the, the operad terms uh, on, on those spectrum. Um, and again, there's this sort of extra condition, which kind of 
goes back to that extra assumption I made when I defined stable infinity operads, which was that this uh, underlying infinity category, the, the O less than or equal to one, that that should be a, a stable infinity category. In particular, it's closed under finite um, co-limits. Um, and, uh, and we require, so as part of this definition, um, we'll require that our algebras um, are exact functors, that they preserve those, those finite co-limits and, and therefore also finite limits. Um, okay, so um, that, that having that condition is, is here to kind of make something work more easily later on, or even though it, it probably makes this definition seem unnecessarily complicated. Um, I, I guess I want to emphasize that, you know, uh, this definition does still um, in, in incorporate um, familiar types of algebras over operads um, in ring, you know, structured ring spectra, um, EN ring spectra, commutative ring spectra, um, things like that. All of those can be can be easily put into this framework um, by choosing O um, in the in the appropriate way. So so this is not a this is not some um, weird version of of algebra over an operad. This is this is a familiar notion, but but maybe phrased in a slightly um, different way. Um, okay, so uh, given that. Um, um, here is our question. This is the main question I want to then then focus on for the rest of the talk. Um, what is the, the stable infinity operand you get when you apply the previous construction to this category of, of O algebras? Um, so what is what what are, what are the derivatives of the identity on O algebras? So um, the first thing we need to do is we need to take the stabilization, um, and that is. Um, you know, the, the underlying infinity category of, of the derivatives of the identity is the, the is spectra um, on C. So in this case, that's spectra on alg O. Um, and this, this calculation is essentially due to Bastera and Mandel, um, who, who calculate this again in, in a, a slightly different phrasing. Um, they're working more with um, sort of a classical um, definition of operads, but again, it's not really, it's, it's essentially the same result. Um, and so, so you can show that you know, the stabilization of Aljo is, is just the category of exact functors from this O less than or equal to one to spectra. Um, so, uh, so that's a nice simple description of, of what the, the, the spectrum objects or what the stabilization is. Um, but it turns out that, that that description actually has another nice um, just description. There's another way to look at these exact functors. Um, and this is, it's to, it's for th at this point, this is really why I've, I've chosen to make things a little bit more complicated earlier on, um, which was so that I could, um, well, they probably still look complicated, just throwing all that up in one go. but. Um, but but here is if you if you sort of focus focus on the um, you know the, the extra bit here that I've added, um, which is is to say that the um, you know, the stabilization of Aljo can be identified with a category of pro objects, um, or or rather the opposite of the category of pro objects. Um, so uh, a pro object in a an infinity category is a co-filtered diagram, so a diagram indexed by um, a, a co-filtered category. Um, and just to say briefly, what is this correspondence that, that I've referred to? Um, well, if you, you can take a, a co-filtered diagram and you can produce um, an exact functor um, by this formula that, that I've put at the bottom here, um, essentially by mapping, you're looking at the mapping objects out of the elements of the diagram and then taking the, that filtered co-limit. Um, and, and it turns out that these are all exact functors from O less than or equal to one to spectra. Um, so, so this is a, a nice way to view um, this stabilization. The, the, st the stabilization of the category of O algebras is the opposite of the category of pro objects in O less than or equal to one. Um, 
if you prefer, you could think of that instead as the end objects in the opposite of O less than or equal to one. But, um, but for, for this talk, it makes more sense to think of it as the opposite of the category of pro objects. Um, just a, a very quick example, if, if O is uh, one of those familiar operads, like the commutative operad, um, so that O algebras are just ordinary commutative ring spectra, um, then what you get is you're taking pro objects in finite spectra, um, and the opposite of pro objects in finite spectra is, is, is well known to just be spectra. Um, and so um, this is sort of re recovering more precisely the bastera mandel calculation. bastera mandel calculate, you know, show that so the stabilization of commutative algebras is just spectrum. Uh, okay, so um, let's let's go to. I really want to remove that circle now. Let's see if I can do that. Uh, I think I can. Um, so so now what we need is an operad structure. We, we're trying to, so we, we've identified the underlying infinity category um, with the category of pro objects, but we, we actually want the, the infinity category itself, the, the infinity operad itself. And so, so this is the, the sort of crucial definition that, that answers the, the question. Um, we're gonna define uh, as an infinity operad of um, pro objects. Um, and so again, the objects are just these co-filter diagrams. Um, and what I've done here is I've defined for you the, um, the, the multi-mapping spaces or the multi-mapping spectra. Um, and this formula should look very familiar if, you, if you're used to working with pro objects. This is just the, it, it, when n is equal to one, this is just the definition of, of morphisms of pro objects. Um, and so all we're doing is generalizing that definition to, to the multi-input setting. Um, and so this is a very natural way to define uh, an operad structure or, or to define an operad uh, whose underlying infinity category is, is the pro object. Um, and the, the structure maps, the composition and, and unit maps are all uh, induced by those in O. So, so this is a very natural extension of the, the operad O to an operad pro of O. Um, o is in fact a, a full sub operad. Um, it's the full sub operad on the constant diagrams. Um, and and so, so this is some sort of very, uh, very canonical um, sort of completion, if you like, of, of O. Um, and this is the, the answer to the, the, the question that, that um, I had a minute ago, and that is um, the, the derivatives of the identity on Aljo um, are equivalent to pro of O. Um, and, and, and so I, I guess I want to address the, the kind of um, probably the most confusing bit, which is why is this, why does this look different than the result of, of Clark from earlier, where we said that the derivatives of the identity um, are just O rather than something else. Um, and this, this actually comes back to the, the question that I think it was Ian asked earlier of, you know, are, are, are the derivatives, um, are we thinking of them as these complete functors or are we evaluating those functors um, at some specific objects? Um, so if you, if, you evaluate, um, if you evaluate the derivatives of the identity um, at the sphere spectra, um, then essentially what you're doing is you're, you're looking at this full sub-operad um, of, of the constant diagrams um, and you just get O back again. So, so this, even though it looks different, this theorem is, is entirely consistent with the, the result that, um, that I mentioned earlier from, from Duncan Clark. Okay, so um, I'm just about out of time. So I will, I will just flash up the slide I have, which is an outline of the proof. Um, the proof is it's not too complicated. It, it just basically says we identify each side with a, a, a full subcategory of something else. Um, so that's, that's the, the proof strategy. Um, it uses the monoidal envelope. Um, and then I have one last slide, which is some, some further questions that you might ask about um, these constructions. 
Um, and I guess I probably want to highlight the third one here, um, since I haven't got time to, to talk about all of them. Um, and that is just this, um, you know, what, what I've done in this talk is I've described a, a way to start with an infinity category and produce an infinity operad. Um, and I've also talked about a process that goes in the other direction, which starts with an, an infinity operad and, and produces the infinity category of algebras. Um, and this last result was about what happens if you compose two of those functors and, and that composing two of those functors is closely related to, to the identity. Um, so this already suggests that there's some kind of a junction going on here. And, and, and I'm just going to throw out the conjecture, which is that um, actually the right thing to say is we have a, a quasi a junction, which is a, a certain type of a junction between infinity two categories. We don't, we don't have an adjunction on the level of infinity one categories. Um, but uh, on the level of infinity two categories, I, I, I conjecture that there is, there is some sort of a junction happening. Okay, um, I have a couple of uh, slides of references, um, which I'm just going to flash up so that if anyone wants to see them, they can then go and, um, and pause the video later on and, and get them. But apart from that, um, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you.